So this is um, the new Dynamic Strut 2.0, and we're doing the mounting process with the tooling so we can do the finished product when we pull our plastic. So the first thing we need to do is take the tooling pieces and mount them to our strut and then set them up on our cast. And these tooling pieces will be the blanks for our finished product when we get our plastic pulled and take those out. So let's get these put together first. And when you mount your strut onto your cast, you want to find your ideal place on the posterior of your cast. Okay, these screws don't have to be in tight. All you would do is want those snug because you're going to take them back out and you don't want to break your tooling off of your cast when you get done. So I'm just getting those on there snug. So you take your model, figure out your toe out or your tibia angle, whatever it is you're looking for, bring them back around in that same plane, and then look at your ankle centers. And I like to split the difference when I can between my ankle centers for my medial and my lateral. And I'll measure up from the bottom to my spot. And this guy happens to be four inches. So he's a bilateral pair. So I'll do the same thing on his other pair so they match when he's done. Um, in this regard, you could go higher if you need to. If you go lower, it just becomes a shoe fit issue. And then you start riding into areas on the back of the heel that you don't need. So let's look at him at this kind of midline mark between our two ankles and that looks really good on him our calf section isn't too high we're not too low that we're back down here into our achilles and our heel where we don't we want to be this seems to be about the optimum place for the strut to work correctly is taking that medial and lateral ankle and then splitting the difference which tends to be about dead center of the medial, sometimes a little higher, or proximal to the lateral. And that four inch mark looks really good. So now that I've got him towed out where I want him, let's get his tibia line here. And he's just about like a so, right down the center. I'll take my marker and I'll go ahead and mark right where my tooling is gonna go. So I don't lose track of this once I've found these areas. We're going to glue these tooling pieces on and then plaster around any voids. So when we pull our plastic, we won't have undercuts in our plastic because the tooling piece has to come out for our finished piece that goes in later. All right, the other angle I'm looking at is this way to see how he's matching up. And that looks really good. And one other little trick I like to do, it doesn't happen all the time, and that is take this uh, distal uh, mounting piece and lift it just off of the cast. An eighth of an inch is about all you really need to keep that from touching right against the body so you're not so close to them. Now these braces have an inner boot so I probably could get away with it without it but I'm going to look at it with it. I'll drop a staple in just to raise that up a little bit so it's not right against the body. Okay, and we'll take a look at our height back here. And what I mean by getting it off the cast is right there. We're right about an eighth of an inch off the cast, and we're still holding a nice median line for our finish brace. So our, what I'm saying by that is our strut isn't standing away from his natural plane this way or this way he's still standing in a good alignment so when he's standing up he's not pulling the strut forward pushing it backwards it's a natural stance point for him all right now we'll take our coyote quick and glue this guy on here and then we'll plaster up around it yeah that looks real good nice and level I'll cover up my staple shoot some for the distal all I want to do is just tack set this, make sure I'm in my place as I wanted to be, right about there, and then keep it nice and level. You don't want your strut tilting the wrong way. So when they're walking on the brace, you want to have this walk in a natural, a natural alignment to their foot. 
So his toe out is like this, and he's, this, this strut is laid perpendicular to the world for him. So when he walks, it's a straight spring like this. It's not torsioning him off to one side or the other. All right, now that that's tacked up and it's staying still, I'll go back in, because this is the only thing that's holding these tooling pieces on is the coyote quick. So I'll go in, I'll fill in some of the voiding, not quite to the edge, but real close. This helps it bond better and it takes less plaster to backfill it. And now I know it won't break off or fall off of there. Now you can also flatten that calf area if you need to, to make it more flush against him. In this case, we're not gonna do that. This is the way we wanna set this one up. So all I'm doing here is backfilling and trying to stay right to the edge, not go past it. It's just easier to plaster it in now, and it gives it a really good tight seal. It bonds it on there so it won't move when we pull plastic. As you've done all this alignment, getting it set up, the last thing you want is for your tooling pieces to fall off or break off. All right, let that set up a second. Something else I like to do before I mount these that wasn't mentioned, I like to rough up the back of my tooling piece just a little bit. It helps the coyote quick stick to it a little better so it doesn't break off of a smooth surface. Uh, and like anything that you glue, make sure it's clean and you don't have any slick agents against it. So you wanna make sure this is good and set up so you don't start torquing on it. This is why we don't tighten these screws down real tight. And I keep pressure on it, hang on to it, and then just gently back these off. I don't want to break off my tooling. I'll loosen these up. Just like that. So as I mentioned before, this blank is what we're going to take out when we're done pulling plastic and then put our finished product in with our studs. And then our strut with our plastic in here will mount up just like that. And you'll have a space to have your plastic in. Okay, so we're gonna plaster in the voiding underneath our tooling. If we don't, duh, the obvious. Plastic gets in there, hooks it, you can't get that out. So you can put this back in. So when you plaster these in, you want to make sure that you are at least purely vertical coming off of that. You have to go out a little bit and sort of mushroom the way. That's a good thing to get that tooling piece out. You can't go inverted backwards on this or just the tooling piece will get stuck in there and you're done. So don't be afraid. Make sure you get your plaster around this and then we'll clean up the edges and try to expose as much of the tooling edges as we can. So when we put our finished piece in, has a good fighting point in the plastic so we're not skimping on the plastic holding the edge of the work for the So we'll plaster this in and then expose as much of the tooling edge as we can so we can get a really good fight with the plastic in the edge without having an undercut. And I'll mix this up so it's pliable but not too thin. We want to move the body with the plastic so that one of the tooling stay in place. So I just go around and do it however you want. Make sure I fill in that undercut good. Give myself plenty, then I go back through after I've done this and clean off the excess. This is the tricky one here. Always seems to be the one that it, you, you want to expose the front there on the tooling piece, but you definitely want to get some plaster in that so it doesn't get hooked. And you can always clean it away and get just exactly what you're looking for with a finish on your plastic so it looks nice. And the heel is the same thing. It's a little more straight up. And it only takes about once of not doing this correctly and trying to get one of these pieces out and you'll never do it again. Because you have to be able to push your finished tooling into the void you're creating with this piece. You don't want it to be in there sloppy. You want it to be nice and snug, but you don't want it to be so tight that you don't get good 
contact berry inside your plastic because you want the face of that finished piece to be all the way up in there as tight as it can go. If you have too much voiding, you can allow for breakage in your plastic because you have a gap. And that you do not want. Well, the rest of the process is just a matter of how you like to do your plaster and finish it out and clean it up and then expose the edge of that tooling piece as much as you can. And this just happens to be my little way of doing it. There's all kinds of ways of doing this. Everybody's got a different technique. All I've done there is just kind of clean it up. Uh, now we need to get rid of more. So this is the edge I'm talking about, your tooling edge. I want to see more reveal on that so I know that when I get done, my uh, plaster or plastic will bite in there. So I like to let it set up. I just take my knife and go around and cut away what I don't want. I'm just exposing the edge of my edge of my tooling and then making sure it's not undercut like we were talking about. So see that comes down and then it goes away from the cast so I know I can get that thing out when I'm done and yet get a really good bite on that plastic. And the nicer you make that look, the nicer it looks too after it's pulled. All right, this down here should be a little harder. Plaster is more set up. That's way better. I'm just cleaning away my edge. All right, this one's a little more dried up, so I'll just take a dry piece of sand screen. Kind of work down that bridge. Make that look a little nicer. This side here looks really good. Going down and then away. See back here, I'm not going to have quite as much exposed because I want to get that piece out, but my sides are going to be holding the majority of that on. And then this side here, I've got a little more sanding to do. A little carried away with my plaster. So you'll see our two sides are completely exposed, and then the front, bottom, top, and bottom proximal distal aren't quite as much. But they certainly could be. Every, every one of these is different when you lay them on there. And then these tooling pieces will also be our guide holes. When we get ready to drill and mount this, we'll use these holes that are in this, let the plastic draw into them, and then we'll come back from the inside with a bit and drill it out, and then we'll come to the outside and drill it out with a finished size so you get a nice straight hole. tooling pieces put in real nice. I was kind of looking at this scene and roughly where my trim lines are going to be. Double checking my cast. Everything looks good here. Uh, I'm gonna throw two nylons over this because he's fairly decent sized foot and a lot of, a lot of length to it. And we're gonna use quarter inch pro comp on him. I wanna make sure I get a really good vacuum. In most cases, a single vacuum nylon is fine. This is just a preference thing. And then I make sure they're not super, super tight around these because you want that plastic to draw in nice. So you wanna have a little bit of flex in that nylon. And once we get our plastic on and it cools, we'll trim them out and go through the process of how to drill it out and keep your holes nice and square so you don't get crooked. A little technique that makes it a lot easier that I've proven time and time again. 29 and 18. There's our 18 and our 29. Always clean up these edges so it doesn't get in the oven and leaving black little burnt marks from frays on the edge. This keeps the sheet in the oven clean for a long time. 
And then we'll clean the sheet off with either alcohol or acetone to make sure there's anything on the plastic to cause it from not sticking. I cooked this close to 400, 375. Set that for, the time I did it, it was roughly 14 minutes at that temperature. So we'll go 12 and check it. Quarter inch typically runs about 15 minutes at that temperature. And Pro Comp isn't like our other plastic. It's harder to tell when it's completely cooked. It doesn't always change color from milky to clear. So time and temperature is, I think, a little more critical when you're heating up the Pro Comp so you don't undercook it or overcook it. I would always stay with a Poly Pro. Copoly is just not a good fit for this type of brace. It's, it's strong, but it has too much flex to it and it doesn't react as well, whereas Polypro is much stiffer and it works better with the strut. The rigidity of it allows the strut to do, to do what it should be doing, whereas Copoly breaks down in the ankle area too much and just does out. You could certainly do it on you know, someone real light, but then you're kind of defeating the purpose of the whole brace. You might as well build them something else, just a you know, PLS, but that's all they need. Typically 3 16 is enough for most of these, but this guy, super active, tall. We're gonna do, we've already done scenarios of 3 16 with him, and with our new strut, we're gonna try this in quarter inch and see what kind of reaction we get out of him. We're gonna make our strut do a lot more work on this brace than it has before. You get less, the thicker the plastic, the less uh, movement the plastic has, the more rigidity it is, so it's gonna put more pressure on the strut, and that's what we want in this guy's application. Every brace I've done for him before at this size, we've done 3 16 and it's worked great. But you get a lot more play with 3 16 You get more movement in your ankle on the, on the follow through. And we're building this one to be a little more beefier. All right, so that's at 12 minutes. And the whole thing, it did have a little bit of milkiness to it, but now the whole thing looks clear. So I'm gonna give it just a little bit longer because the feel of it. This stuff's a little bit different. It's got a little more texture to it. Okay, take me. And if you have to, get enough for your... Good? Yeah, 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 we're doing great. All the way up there. All the way around the toe. Yeah, I feel this is stiffer. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and hit it. Beautiful. Now, see how that drew around those? That's what you're looking for. Really good draw, and then no undercut, so we know we can get the tooling out of there. Very nice, John. Yeah, that drew in nice. You can see the holes on the back of it and everything. Even in quarter inch, it draws in real good. So when we get ready to do the finishing process, I've tried it where I've drilled from the outside with you know, a, a starter bit and then a finish bit. The trouble is you can get off. And if you can drill from the inside out, the depth of the hole acts as a drill gauge for your bit and it lines it up straighter. So I do my, my punch hole from the inside, zing, zing, and it keeps the hole more centered and straight so it's not crooked. Then I take my finish bit and drill it from the outside. And almost every time I've done that, I can take the, tool, the finish piece with the studs on it and put it right in their money. It doesn't, it's not off. Cause you get your hand angle wrong with the drill and your hole is a little too low or too high. And then when you go to put your finished piece in, the studs have a hard time matching up with your hole. So when I teach people how to do this or we work with our guys, I try to, I mean, I reiterate that inside out first and then it just keeps the hole line straighter, which saves a, a bunch of time. I did that because I don't want to 
I don't want to break this toe off by accident. We're going to probably reuse this mold again and again. And if you open that toe up, when you go to pull it off of there, it just saves you from breaking it. This is how I line it out. I figure out where my finish lines kind of are. And then I do this, I cut it out straight, and then I go back in and cut the calf, and then that, so that way it's not all over the place. The nylon will be underneath that tooling piece. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And I have to mark them left and right because you can mix them up. You have bilaterals. So now see when I pull this off of here, having that toe exposed doesn't put any pressure on it. So it just keeps my cast nicer longer. You want to see the inside of that. You can see where your glue and everything is, and where your buildup was. So, typically I like to just go ahead and leave that in there and do my sanding and then I'll drill my holes out. So all I want to do is just get rid of the buildup. You can still see the two holes. And while it's in there, I'm just going to leave it and I'll sand this. And then when I get ready to do it, I'll drill those from the inside and then pop that out and then come back here and put the finished sized hole in it. And if it pops out, it's no big deal. Just make sure you keep track of the one that you took out of there and put it back in nice and tight when you go to drill. Yeah. So see then that coyote quick, it'll come right loose from that. It's just enough to hold it in place. That's all it does. And that plaster buildup out here, you can see how nice it makes it look. Your transition line, you know, nice and clean, smooth all the way around. All right, let's go rough these out. Now we need to drill out our tooling pieces so we can get ready to put in our finished piece that will be mounted on there like a so. Uh, I'm using a 3 16 drill bit. That seems to line up nice with the hole. It keeps you, and this is what I was talking about, drilling from the inside out first. Your hand angle is better so you don't get so off because now you have the depth of the a tooling piece to kind of keep you straight. And I can use a hand drill for this. You certainly don't have to use whatever you want. So when you go through, that keeps you from messing up in angle because it keeps a nice straight line just because you have like a guider basically. Then when you punch your next hole, you'll be straight on. Yep, nice and straight. And it matters because you're trying to run this through those two holes. And if you have one of them off, then your holes won't line up correctly. And another hole. Double check it. Nice and straight. Beautimus. A 3 16 works good for that. Taking these out, you can see if you look around there, how nice we were on these two edges. And then there's that lower section where we had a little bit of plaster in the upper, we had just a teeny bit of gapping. Uh, a nice regular screwdriver works good to dig those out with. 
and then peel out your nylon when you get to that. Let's check this one. Oh good, we left ourselves just a little bit of a channel right there, that's nice. Or we can get our screwdriver in and just lift it out. There we go, that nylon came out nice. You could stay with your hand drill if you want, but I happen to have a stand-up drill press here and I like using it for this next step. But you certainly could, when you get the right size bit, take your hand drill and now you've got guider holes so you can punch down there nice and straight. And since I have, like I said, a drill press, just a preference, it's already set up. Your next drill bit is a 2364. If you go eighth inch, you're gonna be a little too big, which will make your studs sloppy. If you drop down below that to an 1132nd, you'll be too tight. Then once I've done that, I go ahead and just walk it a little, teeny bit of wobble. Make sure I've got a nice size so it's not oversized. A little bit of reaming. Now when we're done, these should match up really nice and snug. You can see they go right in. This is backwards, but our hole matching is real good. All right, the reason why I'm gonna come back to the bench is I wanna make sure those are in there good and tight. Uh, deburring tool is nice to have, just in case you don't have a super sharp drill bit. We happen to have one of these real nice ones here that you can do by hand, but your regular deburr will work. You know, get a nice clean hole. Just makes it easier to put your mounting plate in. Yeah, that'll work good. This really is a slick little tool. I like it. All right, now we're going together. We're matching up. And this is where I like taking something to press it in to make sure it's in there good and tight. Now when we put our plate on and our screws in that, it's going to pull this bottom one up a little bit. So you want to look for that. I know I'm not quite all the way in there, which means my hole is probably just a touch tight. But when we mount this with our washers and our nuts, That'll suck that in there just perfect. With that plaster, you want to leave yourself a little grace. Okay, that felt good. And those are nice and even, so I know I've got that in there buried. This one's just a teeny bit snug on the bottom, which isn't bad. Way better than being sloppy. And that's what I was saying about that drill bit, the 2364. I mean, that's right on. Just right to where you can put it in there and no play. So this whole mounting bracket now is solid. It can't go anywhere. Then you mount your strut. It can't go anywhere once you tighten it down. So let's just check our deburring. Maybe that will help us out a little. That'll work. We just need to suck it down with the finished screw. That's already going in there better, I can tell. Okay, so now we've got it mounted. And then super important, you can see how the mounting plate studs, these studs are not sticking out past the face of the strut. They have to be flush exactly or below because if they stick out past it you can't get your strut tight and you'll have problems this is quarter inch plastic which mounts up to these strut lengths and mounting plate lengths perfectly you put on your washer 
and your screw, bring them both down tight. And then we'll do a, make sure we're getting a good recess in here. Now we'll tighten these down, taking turns. So we pull that, if the plate is loose, this will help pull that plate into place so it's not crooked. That feels wonderful. Okay, both those are nice and tight. Our plate looks like it's in there 100%. Our screws are not sticking out past the face of our mounting plate. They're in there over three quarters of the way, which is fantastic. Now we'll pick one of these off, do a little check to see how we are on stud depth to our strut. Wonderful, it's not sticking out past it. Okay. So on the quarter inch, that comes out right on the money. Now, on this upper, since the plate is thicker here and thinner there, we are going to have some stud length issues with it sticking out past it. Okay, so this was the one that we put in. The top went in all the way. The bottom was a little bit snug due to the way we plastered it, so I can tell it's not quite in all the way. Go ahead and set this in place. Take one of our screws and washers and tighten this down to make sure we pull it all the way in. Okay. Now, let's draw that in. And we'll draw in the upper. The other thing I've done here is use different colored screws. The lowers are an M6 by 20. The uppers will be an M6 by 16. A little bit shorter to make up for the thinner part of the strut. Now, this is what happens when your studs on your mounting plate are too long. You don't get a tight bite and they have to be knocked down. This should happen. You'll need to mark them, take them over to the grinder and knock them down a little bit, shorten them up. All right, so this is what we've got right now. We're talking 16th of an inch, roughly. Take it back apart. Leave your mounting plate in your plastic and take it over to the grinder and we'll do some checking and make sure we got this correct. Okay, we could use a Troutman to knock them down. You could use a grinder, you could use a file. I'm gonna go ahead and use the Sutton and then I'm gonna take them down and then I'm gonna double check them on my uh, strut and then I'm gonna take it out and clean up my edges. So when you do this, and we're back in the other stage, you could come in here and mark this so you have a better depth idea, but it's so close, just bumping them down with the grinder, you'll get what you're looking for. We'll take them back out, knock these down a little more. All right, that looks real good. My lower hole is definitely just a hair below my strut thickness. My upper one's just a teeny bit long, almost perfectly flush. So before I clean them up, if I can get a screw in here comfortably, let's go ahead and make sure that it's in there nice and snug so we didn't undergrind. I mean, you've got the thickness of the strut here to play with as far as how much you can grind off. You don't want to be below the, the base of the strut its thickness, but you can definitely be a little lower than that one was. All right, that pulled that in nice and tight. So there's how much the upper needs to come down still. Less than a 30 second, and then we'll clean up the edge. And let's check our lower now that we've drawn that in nice and tight to make sure it hasn't changed. And this can be a very quick machining thing to do. OK, 
Okay. Yeah, we drew our, our lower end just a teeny bit more, not much, and that's still flush. So that means our lower one is, is in there all the way into our plastic, into our channel. All right. Now let's go ahead and mark this so we know this is the distal or the bottom of our bracket, our mounting bracket. So when we put it back in, we put it back in the same way because there is a little bit of height difference in the angle of our mounting plate. We'll take that out. Since we were that close, I'm just gonna take a file and just file a little bit of that off. Now, let's draw these back down and we should be golden. Okay, so now we know we're at flush or below because the washers are laying right against the strut without being tilted. And we'll check the inside. Our screws are in there more than three quarters of the way. So we know we've got good bite. They're not sticking past it so it can hit the patient. Take it back apart. Loctite your threads with uh, blue Loctite and crank them back down. Then of course you can do whatever you want traditionally, ankle pad straps, you know, a calf strap, whichever you prefer. Uh, this gentleman is gonna have, you know, a strap right here. He doesn't even wear an ankle strap. His shoe comes up and, collect and catches him in here. He doesn't even need one. Between whatever padding you use and strapping, uh, use the stock pads that come with it. Skive the edge, glue it in. It sits right over the plate just like that so that none of this is exposed and then you're finished. Mm -hmm.